Welcome to the Best Interest Podcast, where we believe Benjamin Franklin's advice that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest, both in finances and in your life. Every episode teaches you personal finance and investing in simple terms. Now, here's your host, Jesse Kramer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Best Interest Podcast. This is episode number 46. My name is Jesse Kramer. Got a pretty good one for you today. I'm recording this on Friday, December 30th, 2022, right before the new year. And okay, I know it's a little bit cliche. There's a lot of content coming out right now that is 2022 year in review or 2023 look ahead, 2023 predictions, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to give you too many predictions about 2023 just because, I'll be honest, I think it's a little irresponsible to make financial or investing predictions about 2023, but I am going to share with you some scientific facts, some cool ideas that have to do with the way our brains work, and specifically when it comes to stuff like habit formation and, and sticking with our New Year's resolutions because a lot of New Year's resolutions are financial related. I wrote an article that had some cool ideas in it, so I'm going to share those ideas with you today in case your New Year's resolution has a financial twist to it. And I'm also going to share a couple unique things about 2022. It's not going to be the boring stuff. At least I don't think it's too boring because a lot of you, you've seen inflation in the headlines. We know that you know, the stock market was down. But there are some pretty unique things about the way 2022 worked out behind us. And at the same time, there are definitely some silver linings, at least that I'm taking from the market performance, investing performance, even the way my portfolio performed in 2022. And these silver linings are keeping me optimistic about the way 2023 and really much further beyond 2023, the way the future is going to unfold before us. So without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. All right, so this first little bit of information comes from an article I wrote back in October. The article is called Nowhere to Hide, Why 2022 is a Uniquely Bad Investing Year. And there will be a link to this article in the show notes. And I recommend you look at this article and also the next article because there are some important charts, some visuals in these articles that really will help you understand what I'm talking about. I'll do my best to describe the charts to help you understand what they look like. But I, I recommend, you know, when you have time, take a look at these articles so that you can see the charts for themselves. So bear markets are nothing new, right? Bear markets are when a market is down 20% or more from its all-time high. Generally, when people say bear markets, they're referring to the stock market. So bear markets and the stock market are nothing new. Friend of the best interest, Ben Carlson, he's been having a field day in 2022 covering bear market history. And then another friend of the blog, Nick Majuli, he wrote a great data-packed bear market article back in March that has been frequently referenced since. I've been writing about bear markets all year. Investing experts, they know a lot about bear markets. History has been a great guide. And we aren't really freaking out over the fact that the stock market is down 22%, 20%, 18%. It depends on which index you're measuring and depends on which part of the year you are looking at the stock market. That is a known risk. And then this is a good lesson for anybody out there who's newer to stock market investing, who's unsure how to think about 2022. Bear markets are a known risk. They've always happened. They always will happen. Years like 2022, when it comes to the stock market, are going to happen for the remainder of your investing career. It's a known risk. So to some extent, I'm saying get used to it. It's part of being a stock investor. That said, 2022 is a little different. We've never seen a year, we've never seen a bear market like this in both stocks and bonds, okay? The fact that it's happening to stocks and bonds in the same year, the fact that both of those asset classes are down as much as they are in the same year, that is uniquely bad. Bonds are meant to be a lower risk and lower reward asset compared to stocks. But most importantly, bonds are, quote unquote, supposed to, have little correlation to stocks. So that's the mathematical underpinning to diversification theory and portfolio design. We don't expect and we don't want stocks and bonds to behave in the same manner over the same time period. Traditionally, they, they haven't been very correlated. 
what that means. So, so just in case you're curious, if you're a, if you're a bit nerdy, right? Positive correlation means two things behave in the same manner at the same time. Negative correlation means that they behave in opposite manners. And no correlation means really that one going up has no sort of influence on what the other one does. So what we're used to seeing in general is that stocks and bonds have little to no correlation. And there's a good chart in the, in the article showing that. And so I went back and I pulled stock and bond data from 1950 to today. I wanted to walk through history to see normal years. So a normal year would just be, I suppose, an average year of stock and bond performance or just how stocks and bonds performed in different years since 1950 and then compare them against 2022. But first, an important point, we should always remember, we should never forget that stocks are inherently riskier than bonds and that stock investors demand higher returns because of that. That's simple risk and reward. And it ties back to the fact that bond returns are generally lower risk and come with a guarantee, right? If you buy, say, a treasury bond from the U.S. government right now, you know, bond rates are somewhere it's three or four percent, you're guaranteed that three or four percent return. That's pretty low risk. That guarantee is low risk. And so if you were to go out and invest in stocks right now, you're taking a real risk that you could lose your money, that a company might go out of business underneath you. You need to demand a higher reward than that three or four percent. So that's again, it's getting into some of the nitty gritty of investing, but it's a good thing to keep in mind. So since 1950, stocks have returned 11% per year. Bonds have only returned 6% per year. And when we compound those returns over 72 years, we do see an enormous difference. So $1 invested in the S&P 500 1950 has grown to $2,180 today. $1 grows to over $2,000. That same $1 in bonds has grown to about $70. So would you rather have $2,000 or $70? It's not a trick question. So then a good question should come up in your head. Why would we own any bonds then, right? Why own any bonds if they've underperformed stocks so much? Well, there's actually a pretty simple answer. So I quote Howard Marks here. Howard Marks, a very famous investor. Quote, we have to practice defensive investing since many of the outcomes are likely to go against us. It's more important to ensure survival under negative outcomes than it is to guarantee maximum returns under favorable ones. End quote. So we want to avoid fearful scenarios where we're forced to sell to survive. We want to avoid those scenarios. Stocks do provide long-term returns and bonds, bonds provide some ballast so that our portfolio is never in some dire situation where we feel forced to sell. Okay. So a balance of the two, a balance of stocks and bonds can provide you with enough long-term returns to meet your financial goals, but also enough stability so that you won't puke along the way. So now I'm going to take a look at some individual years. So 1966, for example, and this is going back again, there are some charts in the article to show you what I'm talking about here. 1966 shows how a conservative portfolio prevents large drawdowns. So if you had held 100% stocks in 1966, you would have lost about 10% of your money. But if you had held a 60-40 portfolio, you only would have lost about 5% of your money. And if you'd held all bonds, well, bonds were had about a 0% return that year. So the stocks lost 10%, bonds lost zero. And then in 2008, great financial crisis. So the stock market dropped about 36, 37% in 2008, very bad. Bonds actually went up. Bonds gained about 8%. If you had had a 60-40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, your portfolio would have dropped 18 or 19%. It's not great. No one wants to drop 18 or 19%, but that's better than losing 37%, which is what the all-stock portfolio did. However, let's face facts. Most years, the stock market is up and bonds tend to drag portfolio performance during those years. So again, I just picked a few years in our timeline. 1996, stocks were up 22, 23%. Bonds were only up 4%. So if you had a 60 40 portfolio, you would have gained 15%. That's nice. But your friends at all stocks, they gained 23%. That's even nicer. 2017 is another example. Stocks were up 21%. Bonds were only up about 6%. 2018, 
Then again, we've seen some years with both stocks and bonds down, right? That's the big thing that we're seeing this year in 2022. But it doesn't happen too often, nor is it too severe. It happened, for example, in 1969 and again in 2018. But in each of those years, a balanced 60-40 portfolio was only down about 5%. It's not that bad, okay? Losing money is never fun, but being down 5% in a balanced portfolio isn't that bad. 2022, however, this year was disturbingly different. Not only has there been no place to hide, but it's been pouring rain on us. So even conservative investors are getting soaked. Across the risk spectrum, from all stocks to all bonds, portfolios are down somewhere from 15 to 25%. That fact is unprecedented. That makes 2022 a very different and a very unique year. So again, as of the, the writing of this article, stocks were down about 22%. Bonds were down 16, 17%. And then a great reference. And if you're going to go to this article to find one chart, I would recommend the chart about three quarters, two thirds of the way down that shows all these different years I've talked about all laid out on the same graph. And one year is going to stick out like a sore thumb because not only does it have some negative returns, but it has very negative returns all across the risk spectrum. So 2022, by far the worst year for stock bond portfolios since 1950. We know, as we talked about before, that stocks can and will drop 20% or more in a year. But the fact that bonds are also down 15% is different. And then a friend of the blog, Sean, from Fighting Fire with Fire, he sent me a great graphic from Vanguard that shows this data in a, in a slightly different form about just how unique and bad 2022 is. So now, the real question is, what should you do about it? What should you do about the fact that 2022 was such a bad year? Question one, should you stop investing? Since stocks and bonds are both down, should you just jump ship altogether? Answer, no, definitely not. Remember, the true cost of long-term investing is psychological. Think about that again. The true cost of long-term investing is psychological. It hurts to see your portfolio drop. I totally get that. My portfolio is down a lot this year. But long-term success comes from enduring that psychological pain, and if you can, leaning into it and invest more if you can. What we've seen historically is over the long run, that is a phenomenal idea to do. It's a phenomenal tactic, a great strategy. But first, you have to deal with the short-term psychological pain. Next question, should you sell your bonds? It's an interesting question, right? The idea is, well, if bonds aren't doing their job, why do I even own them? Well, it is a good question. The answer, though, is no, you shouldn't sell your bonds. To be honest with you, it's too late for that anyway. If you had a time machine and you could go back to the beginning of the year, yes, you should have sold your bonds. But predicting the future is really hard and it's irresponsible usually for investing professionals to even try to predict the future. I know many people do, but I'm not in favor of predicting the future. Instead, I'm in favor of building a durable, diverse portfolio that can survive any circumstance. You know, the leading indicator for future bond returns is whatever the current interest rate is. And if you understand, bonds are very mathematical in nature, right? You pay $1,000 to buy a bond. The bond is yielding 4%. You're going to receive $40 per year because that's 4% of 1,000 from now until the bond expires. When the bond expires, you're going to get your $1,000 back. It's a very basic, guaranteed, mathematical calculation. So having bond rates right now at 4% is a strong signal that you'll achieve 4% returns on near future bonds. 4% returns over the next few years, that's not too bad. I mean, this year we lost, what, 15%? But bonds over the coming years are expected mathematically to perform better than they did in 2022. So next question. So, Jesse, you're telling me I should just sit here and just take it? I mean, that's not really advice, is it? Well, it's a good question again, but here's my answer. Remember what John Bogle famously said, quote, my rule, and it's only good about 99% of the time, so I have to be careful here. When these crises come along, the best rule you can possibly follow is not don't stand there, do something. But instead, don't do something, stand there, end quote. That's right. You heard him right. Don't do something. Stand there. That's the right advice. It feels almost inhuman. I know because we are biologically wired for action. When something goes wrong in our lives, we want to do something, 
right? Adrenaline starts pumping fight or flight. You either stand there and fight or you run. Either way, you're doing something. But what John Bogle is saying is that in times of trouble, actually, you want to not do anything at all. You want to just stand there and let the trouble pass you by. It's actually, now that I think about it, it's kind of like that one quote from Dune. If you, if you know what I'm talking about, there's this famous quote about letting the fear flow through you. When the fear is gone, you'll remain standing there. That's basically what you want to do with your investment portfolio. So you can consider doing something before you file your taxes, like tax loss harvesting or rebalancing your portfolio, but you should not consider abandoning your long-term investing plan. That's the difference between an emotional investor who reacts to their gut and a rational investor who follows logical rules. Your gut wants to end the pain to do something. That's totally understandable. But logic, intelligence, that suggests that you do something otherwise. So will you succumb to your gut or will you listen to the combined logic of many investors far wiser than me or you? Personally, I'm listening to those wise guys. So 22, it was a uniquely bad year. It's understandable to feel glum about it, but you don't need a uniquely special reaction. Stay the course, just keep buying. Let the markets in your portfolio recover in the long run. Okay, let's make 2022 feel a little bit better. But first, in order to get there, we do have to start with some some more unfortunate news. If you had started investing in the S&P 500 five years ago, so that would be what? At the beginning of 2018, 2018, 2019, 2020, 21, and 22. If you had started investing in the S&P 500 at the beginning of 2018, this year, 2022, has erased all of the gains you've ever earned, okay? There's an article link in the show notes, you know the deal. There's a chart in the article that shows a portfolio that's been dollar cost averaging into the S&P 500 since the beginning of 2018. COVID caused a small speed bump in this portfolio's performance, but the market quickly shrugged COVID off. By late 2021, after four years of investing, this particular investor would have been up 80% over four years or about a 16% compound average growth rate, internal rate of return, however you want to think about it. 16% per year over four years, that's awesome. But one year later, today, they've lost all their returns, right? Maybe the money they've invested in 2018 was still up, the money from 2019 was still probably up, but a lot of the money they invested in 2020 or 2021 and all the money they invested in 2022 is now negative on total. So their portfolio has returned essentially 0% for five straight years. Stocks, 0% five straight years. Ouch. And yes, zero return is a lame result. And it's especially painful after tasting that sweet, sweet nectar of 80% returns just one year ago. Everything is relative, especially in our minds. And humans innately compare current conditions against the past. That's just how we roll. But now it's time to learn an important lesson. You know, one of the maxims here on the best interest is when in doubt, zoom out. Hard as zooming out might be. And the lesson here is that stocks are not a five-year investment. Okay? Stocks are not a five-year investment. Preferably, stocks are a multi-decade investment. We need to zoom out to that time scale. And sure, sometimes even multiple decades fall short of expectations. You know, we've seen multiple 20-year periods in stock market history. So this is going back to 1871 now in the S&P 500. We've seen multiple 20-year periods of zero return. They're not common, but they happen, okay? When we go out to 30 and 40-year periods, that's where we start to see a more steady, far from guaranteed, nothing's ever guaranteed in the stock market, but a more steady, reliable rate of return that might be 5%, 6%, 7 or even 8% per year. 10 years, 5 years is not a long enough period to see those returns on a regular basis. So personally, I'm still buying stocks as part of my retirement portfolio because I have more than 23 years to age 55 before I can possibly sell a single stock from one of my retirement portfolios. Over that period of 23 years, the historical odds are definitely in my favor. 
And when I turn 55 or more likely 59 and a half, I'll only sell a portion of the stocks in my portfolio, right? Most of the stocks I'll continue to own. I'll only sell the stocks that I need to fund that year of retirement. So really, I'm sitting here at age 32 today. Most of the stocks I own, I'll be selling after age 62. Some of them even after age 72. And for that reason, the stocks I own today will be held for 30, 40, 50 years. That's the period that I'm thinking about. And the historical data over that period looks phenomenal. And again, there are a series of charts in this article showing the S&P 500 rolling 20-year returns, 30, 40, and 50-year returns annualized. And yeah, you see on some 20-year periods, you see some near zero returns. But once you go out to 40, 30, 50-year periods, you see no such thing as a negative return. So here you might be listening to this podcast sitting in 2022. You're a younger investor or maybe a newer investor, or maybe you are an experienced investor, but your investment gains have been crushed by 2022. If you're a younger investor, I mean, there's a very good chance that your investment portfolio is now underwater. You might have less money in your portfolio than if you had just put your money in a bank account for the last three or four years. I see you. I hear you. I know that it stinks. It, it really does stink. That said, I'm zooming out and I'm actually feeling good about zooming out because I know when I zoom out to that multi-decade timeline that the data, that history is on my side. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. Okay, guys, next idea. This is a cold lesson coming in from the Buffalo Blizzard. I'd love to know if you find this interesting because part of this is a little scientific and nerdy and doesn't quite have to do with finance, but there's definitely an interesting investment idea in here. My wife's family, they live in Clarence, New York, which is about 10 miles east of downtown Buffalo. I mean, it is suburban Buffalo. We sat in their house over Christmas weekend as four feet of snow and consistent 50 to 70 mile per hour winds turned the world around us into a snow globe. I mean, literally, Buffalo got crushed by the storm, but maybe not in the way that you guys are thinking. Because many of you are probably thinking, well, it's the snow, right? The snow is the problem. Four feet of snow sounds unimaginable. How can society function under four feet of snow? It's a totally fair question. But we're used to deep snow in upstate New York. We've always had these lake effect snowstorms. It's a pretty unique weather phenomenon, actually. But long story short, these snowstorms blow in from Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. They tend to be very isolated, narrow bands of weather. But we're used to these lake effect snowstorms that can dump multiple feet of snow overnight. And we've built infrastructure to deal with it. We have plows to clean the roads, salt to melt the ice, snow blowers, snow shovels, commercial snow clearing businesses to keep our homes, sidewalks, driveways clear. So don't get me wrong, four feet of snow is still a ton, but give us a day to clean up and we'll be back to business as usual. That's just living in upstate New York. But the substantial difference in this Christmas blizzard of 2022 was the wind. Weather stations all over Buffalo recorded hurricane force winds during this storm, and that wind changed everything. I've got a video. I'll link to this article in the show notes and you can see a video. Maybe I'll just link to the video too because it's on YouTube. I took a video from my in-law's front yard, just a 30-second video on December 23rd, so you can see what the snow was like. Because wind-blown snow, especially at high wind speeds, it turns visibility to near zero. So for hours, we sat in my in-law's living room. We couldn't see the house across the street from us. It's only 200 feet away. We couldn't see the house. And maybe you're asking, well, what's the problem with not seeing your neighbor's house? Fair question. The problem is roads. Zero visibility it cripples roads and in turn cripples the community. Imagine driving with this white frigid blanket blindfold over your windshield. And what if that blindfold keeps up for hours or days? You can't keep driving in that, right? It is so dangerous. But you can't stop driving either. If you stop, you'll block the road for other drivers, assuming they even see your car in the whiteout. And it really is a whiteout. We couldn't see our neighbor's house 200 feet away from us. Sometimes visibility got down to less than 10 feet, it seemed. And when you're driving and your car has speed as you're going into that whiteout, 
It is such a scary feeling. So you're crawling down the road. You're barely seeing anything as a snow depth grows around you. And unless you have a powerful car or truck with snow tires, yes, if you're not aware, snow tires are a thing, you'll eventually lose traction and then your car will get stuck. Your choices then are to stay inside your car, which is a very scary proposition in near zero temperatures, or to abandon the car and venture out into the blizzard on foot. Either way, your life is now in danger. Snow plows, they can't see either. They stay home until the weather clears, and so the road conditions stay bad and grow worse, right? Plows are your lifeblood during a snowstorm. They keep the roads clear. Well, in this storm, the plows weren't out for 36 plus hours after the snow started because the plows couldn't see. If you can't see, you can't drive. 99% of Buffalo's problems were directly tied to those road issues. Even the most important vehicles, ambulances, fire trucks, utility trucks, they couldn't drive for the same reasons talked about before. Too snowy, zero visibility. Many Buffalonians, including me to some extent, learned this face-punching reminder of the importance of functioning roads. The Romans, it turns out, were onto something. I take roads for granted. You might take roads for granted too. So I implore you to learn this quick lesson. Don't take roads for granted. Give them the respect they deserve. They're really important for our society, for our communities. But let's say you weren't on the roads in Buffalo. Let's say you were just snowed in at home. You don't really care about the roads. You're warm, well-fed. You got a 24-pack of Buffalo's favorite Labatt Blue sitting in the garage. Well, despite your relative luxury, you still have major concerns. What if the power goes out? It was really windy, remember? Utility trucks, they can't reach your house until the roads are clear. My in-laws, their street wasn't plowed until Sunday at 7 p.m. The storm started Friday morning. That's 60 hours. Are you prepared for days of no electricity? And what if your home heat is all electric? What are you going to do when the, when the house temperature drops? Will you be safe in that cold? What about the pipes in your house? They'll freeze if you're not careful. It got down into the single digits Fahrenheit on Friday and Saturday. That's really cold. Well, what if your medical needs require electricity, right? What if you have a dialysis machine or something to help you breathe and it can't work because you don't have any electricity? What if you run out of food? All the stores are closed, right? Walmart, Wegmans, our grocery store, all the stores are closed. And even if they were open, how are you going to get there? What if you have a medical emergency, right? Some of the deaths, as sad as they are, some of the deaths involved people having medical emergencies, a stroke, a heart attack, and then the ambulances simply could not reach them. They couldn't drive down the roads. Erie County, which is where Buffalo sits, they announced during the worst of the storm that emergency services were inoperable. You call 911, they say, we're really sorry, we can't help. No police, no fire, no ambulance. It was too unsafe for them to drive. I mean, have you ever experienced that kind of situation? I personally have not. Maybe I'm just lucky, but it's kind of scary. So this blizzard reminded all of Western New York how our societal infrastructure is delicately interlinked. We saw, to borrow an investing phrase, the correlation of outcomes going to one. Correlation, what does that mean? Well, it's easiest to explain this idea through examples. So under normal conditions, the following ideas would have nothing in common, right? They would be completely unrelated ideas. Number one, the efficiency of a Wegman supermarket. Number two, your great uncle's heart condition. Number three, the worn tires on your Toyota. Number four, the near empty gas canister in your garage. And number five, the old maple tree on the side of the house. What do those ideas have anything to do with one another? But when a blizzard chokes out society's infrastructure for three days, formerly uncorrelated ideas can suddenly share a remarkably similar and bad outcome. A tree branch falls in the wind, knocks out your power. Without power, your fridge dies and the food spoils. Just when you need food most, the local grocery store shuts down. You need to go find food, so you start to clear out your driveway of all the snow. Well, you run out of gas for the snowblower. You start shoveling. Then your great uncle comes over to help. He has a heart attack while helping you. It's all too common. 911 isn't even responding, so you drive your uncle, great uncle, to the hospital. But your car doesn't come close to gripping the roads. Things only get worse from there. Everything goes bad all at once, and it's all tied back or correlated to the same blizzardy root cause. Financial markets have a similar idea. It's long been said, during times of crisis, correlations go to one. We saw it, for example, in March 2020. COVID created an uncertain future and investors everywhere ran for the exits. Sell, sell, sell. 
Stocks, bonds, commodities, everything fell in price all at once, driven lower by panicky selling pressure. Why would wheat futures ever behave in lockstep with NVIDIA stock? I mean, there's no causal relationship between the two, except for the cases where there's a global crisis. That global crisis, by definition, right, it's global. It ties everything together. Now, some of you might be thinking, but Jesse, this Buffalo blizzard or COVID or any other example you want to use, these are black swan events, right? Nobody could have seen them coming. Well, I disagree. You know, guys, you, you can't plan for an alien invasion. That, in my opinion, is a true black swan. But a blizzard in Buffalo, New York, you can plan and prepare for it. Now, your preparations might fall short, right? At a certain storm intensity, there's only so much puny humans can do. You can't keep your street clear personally. You can't prevent a tree from falling on the power lines down the street from you. There's only so much you can do to prepare. But you can do things like stockpile a little extra gas for your snowblower, own a generator for emergency electricity, own a wood stove for emergency warmth. You can fill the pantry with enough non-perishable goods to survive for a few days. You can keep your body reasonably fit just in case you have to shovel snow for an afternoon. None of these things are easy. Some of them are expensive, but they are possible to do. You can plan a little more margin than you typically need just in case your storms are a little worse than you're typically used to. Correlations don't go to one forever. The snow and wind will stop, the roads will clear, and normal, uncorrelated life will resume. But only if you survive to see it. Okay, margin helps you survive. Similarly, you can plan for market crashes or even for natural disasters that rattle entire economies. A constant theme over my past four years on the best interests is that diversification is the simplest and most effective measure for preparing and planning market downturns. Yes, there have been periods in market history where correlations went to one and all assets in a diverse portfolio decreased at the same time. But much like a blizzard, those correlations eventually break. Now, if you have a concentrated portfolio or a levered portfolio, those portfolios die in those kind of drastic, scary scenarios. They don't live to see the other side. There's no recovery. There's no thaw. The fact that the correlation eventually breaks doesn't matter to them because their portfolio is dead. Diverse portfolios, however, bounce back, even if the diversification briefly breaks during the worst of the disaster. Now, practically speaking, the Buffalo blizzard reminded me to beef up my emergency prep at home, to respect our roads, and to remember that Mother Nature still calls the shots. But for my investing brain, the blizzard was another reminder about the power of diversification, preparing for bad times before they inevitably occur. That next storm is always coming. All right, last little stanza here, guys. Let's talk about 2023. Let's look ahead. And specifically, if you have a personal finance-related resolution, I'd, I'd love to hear about it, actually. Feel free to write in and share with me what your resolution is. Let me know if there's something I can do to help. But in the meantime, here are nine, I think, interesting, cool scientific facts, scientific truths about the way our brains work to help you improve your finances and reach that personal finance resolution. I was listening to a recent episode of Freakonomics where author Yuval Noah Harari said, I mean, he's talking about other stuff, but he said, quote, viruses exist whether we believe in them or not. Even if you don't accept the stories about viruses, they can still kill you. Now, okay, guys, this is not a podcast about viruses, but it is about science, or at least this section is about science. And namely, I want to describe these nine scientific facts that can help you achieve your personal finance goals, whether in 2023 or beyond. So I hope you employ these ideas because the science is true, whether you believe in it or not. But the sooner you believe in it, the sooner you internalize it, the better off your personal finance outcomes will be. So the first one, the science says that stress is a killer and finances are one of, if not the greatest causes of stress in our lives. So the tip here is simple. Do what you can to reduce your financial stress. And the remainder of this list will help you do that. Number two, invest in knowledge, right? The science says that ongoing education is a gold mine. Not only does new knowledge help you make smarter decisions, but education provides the confidence you need to take action. 
So how do you educate yourself on personal finance and investing? Well, here's my method. Every week, I read dozens of financial articles. I listen to 10 plus financial podcasts. Granted, I'm a nerd for this stuff. I do it professionally, right? I write about it. I podcast about it. I work in wealth management 40 hours a week. I read books. I've written a book. You don't have to be as nerdy as me though, guys, okay? And again, one quick example, no pressure. I mean, I share the best content I find every week in my quick weekly email. One email, about 6,000 people read it every week. I've got six, seven links per email of good information that I've learned. It's not a bad way. I mean, I think my readers appreciate learning that way. There are other lists that do similar things or other ways that people take a bunch of info for around the internet and distill it down into quick little emails. I think that's a great way to learn. And I'd, I'd recommend you start if you haven't started yet. Number three, measure first. So the science says that data-backed and data-driven decisions lead to better outcomes than simple gut feel. So I don't write or talk about budgeting that much anymore. I spend most of my time talking about investing, but I still maintain my budget on a weekly basis, measuring my spending, measuring my earning, measuring how my accounts are changing over time. Why? Well, because you can't manage what you don't measure. The best way to measure your personal finances is with a budget. Personally, I use YNAB for my budgeting. And if you go to this article, there's a link to YNAB that you're more than welcome to use. And it helps you get two free months of the app if you want to give it a shot. But there's also some counter science here because whatever budgeting method you use, make sure it's simple enough that you can maintain the habit of budgeting. It's better to be dedicated to a 90% solution than it is to burn out on a 100% solution. YNAB is admittedly more detailed than some people prefer. So other ideas include mint.com, using a simple spreadsheet, using a spreadsheet that maybe someone else created. There are lots of budgeting spreadsheets online, some free, some paid. You could probably use your bank's budgeting solution. A lot of banks have one. Or you might just record stuff with pen and paper. Tip number four is be smart. S-M-A-R-T. Because the science says that if you choose to set goals, you're more likely to reach them when you make them SMART goals. And then if you don't set goals, instead you should focus on habits, and we'll get to that next. But first, let's talk about SMART goals. The SMART acronym stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time-Based. Your goals should tick each of those five ideas. So if your resolution is, I want to be better with my money, Well, that's not a SMART goal. It's not specific, it's not measurable, and it's not time-based. Same goes to resolutions like, I want to save more, or I want to budget. Those aren't SMART goals. But if instead you said, I want to save $6,000 in my IRA in 2023, that is a SMART goal. Or maybe your goal could be, I want to update my budget on the second and fourth Sunday every month in 2023. That's a SMART goal. Next, number five has to do with habit formation. This one isn't super specific, but I do have some links to some fantastic content if you want to learn more, right? Habits make or break us. It is almost scary the more you learn about it, how much we are lifted by our good habits and how much we are dragged down by our bad habits. So I linked to a quick article from Farnham Street that covers the basics of habit formation really, really well. Now, personal finance, like many New Year's resolution-y behaviors, they're largely a function of stopping bad habits and forming good habits. I mean, just think about health-related resolutions. I want to stop eating like crap, and I want to start going to the gym. Stop the bad habit, begin a good one. Now, perhaps the most hyped book of 2021 was James Clear's Atomic Habits. And it was so hyped, in fact, that it turned me off. Honestly, I avoided the book I very intentionally did not buy the book. I didn't read reviews about it only because it was so over-marketed in my opinion that I just just knew the book would let me down. But then a, a good friend, a friend of the blog, Craig, gave me the book. I think it was for my birthday. And so now I have a copy and I'm not gonna not read it. So of course I read it and it was really good. It lived up to the hype. So I think Atomic Habits is a great resource to help you improve your habits. And then there's a good video podcast from a Huberman Lab that, again, he's a, a neuroscientist and an ophthalmologist, and he talks about the, the science, the, the biophysiology or whatever the term is, 
of habit formation. So that's a good one. Okay, number six, the next tip is to understand the fulfillment curve because the science, the psychological science says that our happiness per dollar, if you want to think of that as a metric, our happiness per dollar eventually plateaus. More money doesn't make us any happier. And our happiness per stuff eventually decreases, meaning that filling our lives with more and more material goods eventually makes us actively unhappy. This idea is called the fulfillment curve. Once I internalized this idea, I began viewing personal finance in a completely different light. My goals are not make the most money nor buy the most stuff. I mean, heck, those aren't smart goals anyway. But instead, my goals are maintain a lifestyle at X dollars per year because I believe that's where my happiness plateaus. I don't need any more money to make me more happy. And my other goal is to actively avoid buying too much stuff because I know that more stuff leads to more stress. So I try as hard as I can to just avoid unnecessary purchases and to regularly think about what I'm surrounding myself with in my house and if I need all that stuff. So the stress of buying too much stuff, what it's worth, it usually presents itself as thoughts like, wow, my house is so messy. Or I've spent my hard-earned money on this crap and I never even use it. What a waste. I mean, those are stressful thoughts. So my recommendation to you listening, understand how the fulfillment curve fits into your life. Number seven, be automatic. The science says that the more decisions we make, the worse we are at decision-making. Our brains can only have so much decision-making bandwidth. This is called decision fatigue. So what do you do about it? You automate your financial decisions. Set up automatic contributions to your 401k, IRA, brokerage account, or any other investing accounts. Set up automatic bill pay, although there is an exception, in my opinion, you don't want to automate bills where you might want or need to negotiate or argue a bill's amount in the future because you don't want to end up in a situation where you paid the bill automatically and then you have to turn around after the fact and say, hey, wait a minute, I actually paid you too much. Okay, so that's the exception. But as much as you can, automate your finances. Not only will you become a better saver, but automation helps prevent costly mistakes like forgetting to pay your power bill. Number eight, social media is probably hurting you. The science says, well, the social media intentionally plays with your emotions with the end goal of serving you advertisements for products it suspects you're interested in. Some of you are probably saying, Jesse, this, is, this advice is clearly confirmation bias because you recently quit social media. Maybe. But I don't think that necessarily means I'm wrong, right? Because question, how do social media companies make money? Answer, advertisers pay them. Okay, well, question, why do advertisers pay them? Answer, because they're serving ads to social media users. Okay, next question, how do the advertisers make their money then? Answer, social media users, that's people like me and you, buy those products and services that they're selling ads for. The whole point of social media, in other words, is to get people like you and me to spend our money by showing us ads for things that they suspect we want. Now, I enjoy spending my money, right? That's part of the reason why I choose to earn money and why I want to work hard. But I don't want my spending manipulated by social media algorithms. My brain isn't strong enough to fight the algos. No offense, your brain isn't strong enough either. Now, I'm not even touching the whole mental health repercussion from social media content, like comparing your everyday self to an influencer's dolled up self and the subsequent spending decisions we make from that. I mean, social media is a cesspool. Okay, last one, number nine. Know yourself, know your brain. The science says that your brain is different than mine. Yes, that's a pretty simple one. That's duh. I, I, I don't know if the science actually says that, but let's be honest, the science says that. So my favorite example of this, though, involves a friend of the blog who I'm going to leave anonymous. He's a good friend, and our brains work in polar opposite ways when it comes to finance and diet, which coincidentally is the other most common New Year's resolution. So I'm this financial nerd. I've got strong financial habits, but I've never maintained a long-term healthy diet in my life. I've probably gone through 20 iterations of different two-week diets, and I've always struggled to cross that next hurdle of making it a permanent part of my life. But my friend is the exact opposite. He's been dedicated to an incredible diet and workout regimen for close to a decade. He's one of the most healthy, fit people I know. 
right? But he's always struggled with overspending, undersaving, bad investing habits for his whole adult life. So his strength is my weakness. My strength is his weakness. And it's funny, how can two people be so similar, but also so different? And it's because our brains are fickle, funny. Your brain is different than mine. My brain is different than his. So my only recommendation here is that you work hard and trust me because it's hard work. You work hard to understand your brain's strengths and weaknesses. If it helps, ask some trusted friends or family for feedback on how you operate. And knowing yourself is a key factor in self-improvement. You know, Socrates, wise guy, said, to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. So if you have financial goals for 2023 and beyond, I hope these nine ideas help you achieve everything you want and more. Happy New Year, guys. Thanks for listening to the Best Interest Podcast. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Best Interest Podcast. If you have a question for Jesse to answer on a future episode, send him an email at jesse at bestinterest.blog. Again, that's jesse at bestinterest.blog. Did you enjoy the show? Subscribe, rate, and review the podcast wherever you listen. This helps others find the show and invest in knowledge themselves, and we really appreciate it. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Best Interest Podcast. The Best Interest Podcast is a personal podcast meant for education and entertainment. It should not be taken as financial advice and is not prescriptive of your financial situation.